there is okay, here's the CME clear port brochure let's look at this So okay, let's return to our topic: OTC versus exchange traded markets. Okay, so uh, we discussed. We remember we discussed the uh, OTC markets uh, and how they work. Okay, uh, different banks in different centers. Okay, so we had this uh, this uh, um, this uh, diagram of the, the set of clocks, and we just assume that Sydney is trading with uh, LA. Okay. And so these banks, we just assume instead of saying Sydney, Westpac, Sydney, and uh, you know West Fargo, Wells Fargo, LA, we just call the bank Sydney and LA. Or they're dealing with each other. So if either bank, so obviously when you remember that every every financial market is a venue for exchanging assets. Remember all our basic definitions. How you see all these basic definitions come in handy even in advanced topics. Okay. Since a financial market is a venue for exchanging assets, every transaction is a financial market is a what did we say? How did we define a transaction? Is a contract to exchange assets. Okay. And then you have actually then you that brings you to the idea of the settlement date when the actual exchange of assets takes place and you discharge the contract. So when you're studying, you're actually linking contract law and the terms from contract law. Okay. And, uh, and then uh, with the with the finance aspect. Okay. So the law and the finance aspect should be always interwoven whenever possible. So here you have the contract to exchange assets. So they have this contract. But if one of the parties, let's say LA defaults. Okay. And the uh, Sydney has already sent the payment. Okay, they were selling dollars, so they already sell the dollar payment. But in the morning, something happens to the LA bank, and the US uh, controller of the currency, controller of the currency, uh, closes. I mean, basically puts that bank into receivership, and all payments stop. So then the bank in Sydney is in trouble. Okay, because they don't receive their money. So any kind. So this is basically what we call a manifestation of credit risk. Okay, that a party does not pay whatever amount is due from it under the terms of the contract. So one party has honored the contract, but the other party has not discharged its obligations under the contract, right? Is this clear? We saw that in, in the previous case. So now we were looking at, so we were trying to understand, uh, so you have this, um, okay, I'll, I'll try to put this also. There is actually in this 15 minute, uh, uh, one of the things we are going to discuss when we discuss capital markets, okay? You heard of this company called DoorDash? It's a food delivery company in the US. Okay, so one of the things we are going to discuss, I'm going to put this here. It's in the 15 minute. It starts from 15 minutes. Okay, there is a discussion of um, there is a discussion of uh, yeah. Let's take that down. Some of this we may not. Uh, I may just leave out some of these stuff. Okay, so we'll just uh, put this here. Um, today's date is what today is 2111 and this is the new course IFM okay, we'll copy this later into a different file for you okay so uh, let me just put this in you can watch it from the 15 minute segment onwards okay so okay so that's your clue so you'll see here IPO versus direct listing you know the difference Okay, so the day of money in the bank, and that he was in no hurry to really spend it all. Okay, so we're not going to listen to this, but you listen to it on your own for 15 minutes, uh, the 15 minute segment onwards. So one of the things we are going to discuss is the, um, uh, one of the things we will discuss is when we cover capital markets, IPO versus direct listing. Okay, essentially a direct listing is basically one where you don't uh, issue any new shares. You just list the shares which you've already issued to your um, private capital market uh, holders. Okay, the equity shareholders in the private capital market. So there's a, there's a story that you can connect to in the real world okay so uh, let's go back to so what were we discussing so I can now close this tab that's why I looked at it okay we have to do this so this folder this this spreadsheet is also in your um, in your folder 
okay so you can actually look at it and then uh, so everything is written down here basically just try to understand don't try to memorize stuff try to understand this so we were trying to understand this point actually that when you trade in OTC markets the counterparty credit risk what we just discussed in terms of a bank in LA not paying its uh, uh, obligations under the contract but the Sydney uh, bank has uh, paid its obligations so the Sydney bank has uh, experienced a manifestation of credit risk so this is the meaning of this statement <clears throat> that um, its uh, counterparty credit risk is managed directly by the counterparties themselves okay and the risk is higher we'll come to that when you understand the the etm you'll understand why the risk in etm is lower and in otc the the risk is higher okay so is this point clear to everyone that what we explained in terms of the transaction where the LA bank does not pay its uh, obligations under the contract and this is what we mean by so basically the 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 bank in Sydney has nowhere to go it has to just eat the loss they'll sue the bank in court but that takes a long time okay but essentially they have to eat the loss all right so this is what it means that the credit risk is managed by the counterparties themselves this is clear this is the meaning of the statement so now we say in the ET, ETM we say that so we are distinguishing on this point how is counterparty credit risk managed okay so that's the point of distinction in ET in OTC it's managed by the parties themselves whoever deals with each other I mean all the banks who are dealing with Lehman Brothers they had outstanding contracts when Lehman Brothers went bankrupt all those guys were on the hook okay they had to eat the loss and because then they sued Lehman and then the uh, receiver comes in and tries to make a pay, uh, you know eventually makes distributions takes a long time so and then we are saying that in the case of ETM it is managed by the exchange okay so how is that done the, the way it's done is basically by the through the what we call the exchange clearing house so if we go back now to this uh, because of that table we had to We'll just keep it at 90 percent at least yeah we can see a little bit all right okay so let's go back to this no these are the actual dates okay yeah here so we go back to this now CME clearing this is actually the clearing house so please note there are also notes these are there we also have readings from Hull uh, for this topic so make sure you read that also but those readings actually first try to understand what I'm telling you those readings are a little bit confusing because he has already started talking about OTC markets as they exist today so the distinction today is a lot less clear okay because of regulatory interventions so first you try to understand the way I'm telling uh, I'm explaining it to you without reading the textbook okay uh, understand the differences because these are the pure differences which have been existed for hundreds of years okay and now since the 2008 credit crisis a little bit was happening before that the bar the differences are getting a little bit blurred but uh, in the Hull book they have not actually given you the classical differences first in a pure form so that it's a little difficult more difficult to understand I think okay so in an exchange what is happening is if you have this say this is the OTC dealer okay on the exchange traded for uh, format this is not the the um, so you you ignore this guy okay and you ignore uh, this uh, these two people for the moment okay they're relevant but we'll just ignore them for the moment okay so what we have in the on the exchange is when there's two parties are dealing on an exchange as we already discussed this in detail in the previous uh, course right so I'm not going to repeat that we already I'm just quickly recapping that so now what you have earlier in the OTC segment if you just ignore this lower part for now in the OTC markets these two parties are dealing directly with each other so there's only one contract there's only one contract okay so uh, the uh, Sydney bank is selling uh, dollars to the LA bank and receiving yen okay now um, uh, all we, we, we can make it receiving Swiss francs or something okay so um, now the city bank is selling dollar and there's only one contract okay so now let's in the in the exchange traded market situation what's going to happen is how is the credit risk going to be different we have already explained this in detail in the previous video so now there are going to be two contracts okay so this guy has a contract with the exchange clearing house so in every exchange there's going to be a affiliated clearing house okay under Indian law every exchange needs to have its own clearing house in the US you can have an exchange which is affiliated to a clearing house but there has to be a clearing house connection for every exchange 
exchange okay so this is the clearing house is the one that takes care of the risk management so you have two contracts and these guys uh, anybody who loses money every night every day there is a settlement of profit and loss so whoever loses money they'll the exchange will calculate how much money you've lost from the beginning of your trade to the closing of that day whatever money you've lost on a mark to market basis next morning by about 10 11 o'clock whatever time early morning you have to pay up that loss otherwise the exchange will close out your contract and in order the other feature of this or you'll find all this written in the in the hull book as well initial margin and all that so this money that you have to put up initially you have to put up this point amount called the initial margin you if you don't put up initial margin you're not allowed to do a trade on the exchange okay the amount of initial margin will vary from contract to contract okay and exchange to exchange but there is going to be always some amount of money so the objective of this side to understand the scheme here the object the reason the clearing house collects the initial margin is that in case like suppose you have lost suppose these guys have lost money after the first day of trading okay and next morning they have not paid up by the deadline okay so the exchange has to close out their position in the market okay and honor the contract with the other party right so that when the exchange closes out the mark uh, the the contractor in the market in most cases they'll be losing money okay it's because this guy was losing money right and that's why he's not paying most of the time okay so the exchange will lose money but they will use that they will use the initial margin to adjust against that loss this is clear okay i've already taken a deposit from you and then you default on your uh, obligations so because of that i have to close out the contract but in closing out the contract i experience some loss but i'm not too worried about that because usually that loss will be much smaller than the amount of money i've taken from you on deposit and because you have forfeited the uh, because you did not honor your obligations the terms of the contract is that you will forfeit your deposit okay so therefore i'll have uh, usually i'll have some extra left over also so i i'm not worried about having to close out the contract in the market is everyone clear we have already discussed this in the previous video the last video of the last course of the previous course okay so this is how the exchange manages uh, counterparty risk okay so this right now risk is called counterparty credit risk that's why you notice that i've used this term here counterparty credit risk okay so that's why before we got into exchange traded markets and otc markets i uh, had to teach you about the different categories of risk okay so because of what what we have is basically now we are going to make a distinction between market risk and credit risk okay so after this point is covered has everyone understood this point yeah. that at et mark etm you have the exchange clearing house manages the risks so the other guy basically has very little risk this guy although this fellow has defaulted this guy is still seeing that the clearing house is honoring the contract with him so he doesn't have a counterparty credit risk problem unlike in the otc case when as soon as this guy defaults this fellow is on the hook he's uh, alone i mean he's no one to help him okay so unlike that otc situation here he doesn't have a concern so we essentially say that in, in atm in a etm uh, situation there is no credit risk okay because so far no clear clearing houses uh, at least in india and the us no clearing house has ever gone bankrupt okay clearing houses have always worked out so therefore we can effectively say that the uh, there is no credit risk okay but there is also but what is common to both these markets so what, one of the things we are saying is the reason we had to come up with a taxonomy of risks before getting to this topic is you need to understand the difference between market risk and credit risk okay so credit is everyone clear about that credit risk is the risk that the counterparty will not honor its obligations under the contract and market risk is just the fact that here like if you have this here so if i buy if i buy euros okay at 748 i buy buy euros and they buy by lunch by lunch time this market has already fallen to maybe 109 or something like that right so i'm losing money yes so this is market risk market risk is just the risk that uh, whatever you trade in the market that trade will end up losing money that's just market risk okay so market risk credit risk are different uh, uh, concepts okay so therefore one of the things we can say about uh, the etm versus otc difference differences is that in etm you have uh, only market risk and no credit risk for all practical purposes technically of course if the clearing house defaults uh, 
then you will have a problem if the clearinghouse goes bankrupt but so far it has not happened just like in india for instance most people would consider a bank a fixed deposit in a bank to be a uh, especially in a public sector bank would consider it to be effectively risk free of credit risk not although technically it is enough. credit risk because if bank of baroda goes punjab national bank is, <laughs> is bankrupt all the public sector banks are actually bankrupt several times over because every budget we put money into them but that's the proof basically for our practical purposes if you put money into uh, even a shady public sector bank uh, there is no real credit risk because the government will not uh, you know make the depositors lose money okay on that deposit so although technically there is a risk established uh so uh, let it be there okay so is this clear so there also we say that for all practical purposes there is no credit risk if you put money in a fixed deposit with a public sector bank in india okay so so similarly we say so therefore what we say is that in the case of etm we have no credit risk but we still have market risk okay so if i buy let's say here like you're seeing this here you see all these crude oil these are crude oil actually these are crude oil futures quotes okay you can see this now if i buy crude oil okay they haven't given bid offers here the last is the last traded price so i buy the january 2020 contract in crude oil 5688 this is on the cme which is an exchange okay this is on the nymex division of the cme you can see here this site site is very informative you can learn a lot okay a uh, lot of information in terms of um, futures contracts uh, all kinds of uh, different energy different kinds of commodity markets okay and the three commodity markets we are going to be studying for our project are all very important global commodities copper uh, crude oil and gold okay so if you develop expertise in any of these commodities later on if you are angling to be an equity analyst you have to remember that you have to develop a sector specialization so one of the sector specializations is oil and gas okay so if you are becoming an equity analyst you can be actually you can be uh, uh, i would say your approach should be even more ambitious so you just specialize in oil and gas and you look at a you take a global view okay to start with you look at us companies and indian companies okay and you just eat up everything in oil and gas all the companies and then you start looking at them both from the perspective of an equity analyst and a credit analyst that is even more ambitious i think that should be your ambitious so then you are flexible you can go in as a credit analyst or you can go in as an equity analyst okay so fundamental difference you understand the difference between equity analyst perspectives and uh, credit analyst perspectives yes what is the difference okay so you will not find this in any book but let me just tell you here broadly the difference between equity analysts and uh, credit analysts okay is that this is actually fairly important so we can write it in in your notes itself we are writing we are discussing as we are going here okay so equity okay i'm writing it this way but actually it should be and then i can write credit analyst everybody knows what credit analyst is all these credit rating agencies yes, you are analyzing the bond credit risk okay okay so uh, equity analyst versus credit analyst so when you when you are looking at companies you should always try to that should be your ambitious goal because usually most people who are equity analyst they don't have a very good insight into the credit aspect of it but actually it's very easy to develop uh uh, uh two prong uh, expertise because you're still looking at the same financials both these guys have to look at the same financials okay uh when you're doing a credit analysis for a company you have to look at their financial statements inside out you have to understand the business inside out okay and the same thing goes for an equity analyst okay but there are some slides so there are certain there are quite a bit of com uh, there's quite a bit of commonality in terms of the subject matter that you have to study okay and the kind of skill set you need the only difference is here the focus is on the focus is on i'm just writing it in like this in sign language long term equity is basically you want to understand one word it's earnings okay or you can make it even better because people sometimes focus on earnings per share but earnings per share can be manipulated because you can manipulate the number of shares through buybacks and things like that so i personally prefer to look at return on equity okay certain other people like buffett and all they look at book value per share again i don't like the per, per share concept you can just look at total book value also but it's even better i feel is just look at return on equity okay in terms of uh, you can look at look at net profit 
profits or whatever but the point is basically earnings okay or main thing about equities is long term earnings potential so when when an equity analyst so that's why you see companies like tesla and all uber and all which are not making money but they're still doing well the share price is doing well why because the investors are not so understand this these basic differences okay you'll not really find this in any book so better understand it properly so the perspective on why is a company like tesla which has actually now been doing quite well in the last couple of weeks why tesla is not making money uber is not making money they're making their huge losses actually <coughs> lyft is also making huge losses why are they why are they why are the share prices going up because the share price the the stock investors are as you saw in your in your um, uh, models which you did like the gordon growth model etc stock investors are interested in long term earnings potential long term earnings potential so tesla is doing well because people think that wow the the market for electric cars is huge and tesla has a dominant position so there's going to be a huge explosion in the now they recently got their uh, shanghai factory going okay so that's why so they're not concerned about the fact that in tesla has no chance of making money in the next year probably let's say okay all they are saying that maybe they'll come to profit sometime soon but it's not because it's not really worked out for them they're not been able to show a profit they've said several times so uber also has no chance of making money in the next one or two years okay moving into profit okay so why is uber why is uber stock price going up okay people are buying hedge funds are piling into uber so it's all based on long terms long term earnings potential remember when you discount when you use a gordon growth model you just replace dividends with earnings because it's the same thing at the end if you have not paid any dividends you'll pay a dividend at the end okay so it's all your earnings have been accumulated and you pay a dividend in the end okay so the thing is it's all based on the perception of long term earnings potential in the long run tesla will make a lot of money in the long run uber will make a lot of money okay so there has to be some so you remember those terms you had these multiple terms right when you have uh, when you have uh, when you're doing your gordon growth model etc you don't have just one term right for the next year you have multiple terms going into infinity right remember that okay so the stock holding the stock has no maturity so you have multiple terms going into infinity so in terms of that kind of equation okay or any other stock valuation if you just discount earnings by cost of equity etc you will have the same kind of concept there are multiple terms because the stock has no maturity so what what is happening essentially is that the people are that investors are not so worried about the fact that in the first few terms you are not making money the first few terms are loss making it's like you understand you've done your npv analysis okay now if you have a project with a high positive npv even though in the first 3 years it does not make money would you reject the project no you will still accept it it's the same concept you understand that okay so basically people are looking at a high npv based on their projections for future earnings so people are saying okay tesla first two years now from now onwards they won't make money but from the third year onward oh, tesla is going to move into profits and then the profits will grow dramatically Do you understand how that can create a high NPV situation, which is the same thing that you are getting a high value for the share because your later terms they have very high uh, numbers in the numerator. Do you understand that? Are you following what I'm saying? That in the later terms the numbers in the numerator are very high. In the in the few first few terms the numbers in the numerator are, are negative. you can see how that can still create a positive npv yes everybody is following so that is the main idea behind equity analyst uh, perspectives the perspectives are different okay the same company same financial statements same industry analysis same sector analysis okay a uh, business strategy analysis everything is the same but the perspective is different the the equity analyst is concerned with long term earnings potential so to some extent their analysis then tends to go into some other areas okay but the credit analyst is basically here his focus is is short term so you understand the difference between earnings and cash flow you can have high earnings with very limited cash flow if i do a lot of sales but those sales are all credit sales i can book some other earnings right and i can show high earnings but my cash flow is not good yes you can have high earnings 
with uh, low poor cash flow okay so there's a difference between earnings and cash flow this this is why i say that financial statement analysis is very important so all those ratios and stuff all that should be at your fingertips you should be doing this practicing it and it only come with practice that's why i told you to select a few companies okay and then eat those companies alive every day basically just chew on everything that comes out on, on that company okay everything should be consumed okay and then you'll understand uh, then and keep on doing financial statement analysis see how their ratios are moving okay understand the industry so there you understand the difference now can you see the difference that are you able to see that there's a difference in perspective okay focus already i've written okay perspective is a much bigger word okay so the credit analyst focuses on short term cash flow you understand the difference between cash flow and earnings but now you should understand clearly okay cash flow and earnings whereas the equity analyst is concerned with long term earnings potential and the credit analyst is concerned with short term cash flow and essentially basically leading to solvency essentially ability to pay debts as they come to okay this is basically what we define as solvency okay not to pay debts after rescheduling payments and all that be able to pay your debts as they come due that's what we call you know solvency okay so this is what the whole this whole credit trading business is all about when you get a high rating like triple a then we essentially what we are saying is that this prop company has a, there's a high probability that uh, companies like procter and gamble and things like that where they have very very strong cash flows okay unilever procter and gamble itc then we say that these companies when they have a triple a rating they will have we'll say that they are the, the probability that this company will be able to pay its debt as it comes due is very high that's why you have a triple a rating okay if you have a very bad rating like a triple c or something like that then you what we are saying is the probability that this company will be able to pay its debts as it comes as they come due is very low okay and then you have rating upgrades and all that okay so uh, so we'll have uh, so so i'll give you the link to the different credit you should have that access to that uh, table okay you don't have to memorize it you should just know file it away somewhere know where to pick it up because you'll get confused whether it's triple a that moody's they have three major credit rating agencies okay and so there you have to know which company's uh, uh, system is being used okay so sometimes uh, so so um, uh, so it's like a capital letter small letters we'll see that it's just syntax you don't have to memorize it you should just know that there are different grades okay all right is everyone clear about this this is a very important thing to understand okay but that's why i'm telling you that you should actually be ambitious and you should follow a few companies take three indian companies three take three big global us companies okay these companies are so dominant that actually now they're saying uh, just recently this, in the same bloomberg uh, program i was just listening to it in the morning uh, this that microsoft and apple combined now their market cap is higher than all the energy companies in the us uh, and then uh, they're higher than all the small 2000 small cap companies because the market cap is coming like two and a half trillion or something like that the combined market cap of apple and microsoft okay so uh, uh, so so this basically uh, why did i get into market cap i don't know <laughs> the discussion anyway so uh, so the point is yeah oh i was talking about the reason i got into apple and microsoft is the big global companies and how dominant they are and by studying these big global companies like amazon and things like that amazon has so many major lines of business you have e-commerce then you have aws okay different kinds of sectors industry sets so it's a fascinating company to study okay so if you take two three global companies okay big global companies and two three indian companies and then as i said eat up everything that comes out about that company all the financials all the news all the coverage all the uh, the the market uh, the analysts earnings calls okay remember the earnings, you know the earnings calls you can find the 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 reports you can just go to the company website and find the reports so if you do that depth is much more important than breadth okay i've always felt and one of the problems i had even with ima program i actually told my professor and he agreed with it it was the end that even in ima the program there's too much breadth and too little depth okay i feel that depth is much more important because if we can we, if we can teach you to do no, take okay, six so companies and just do uh, like eat up everything that no, comes okay, out on so that so company so everything that exists okay that kind of training that process that you go through to do that is much more um, 
that process then you can repeat that process with other companies okay so learning to do no, in-depth analysis is much more important than knowing a little bit about lots of things okay so depth is all this is my personal bias that depth is more important than and than breadth so that's why you should do that so you have to put in enough effort because now in this day and age you have so much uh, you have so much uh, so many resources available to you okay so there's no excuse for uh, not devouring everything that is coming out on the companies that you're following okay so yeah okay so the first point that we made was uh, in, in ETM you have market risk you have in both cases but the difference is that in ETM you don't have credit risk okay for all practical purposes in OTC you have both market risk and credit risk and so the point we are saying is credit risk is managed by the exchange clearinghouse and because clearinghouses are very uh, high, highly rated basically very solvent because of the way they manage their own credit risk by taking deposits okay by taking an initial margin so they're very uh, unlikely to go bankrupt so all practical purposes no credit risk okay so we already discussed this point and so this other important important point that I wanted to mention so that you can see here that uh, there is a lot of commonality same financial statements all that so make sure this should be your goal okay <laughs> understand the two perspectives because this kind of differentiation you will never see discussed in any textbook that what is the difference and focus between these two companies th these are important roles that you might be interviewing for okay so at least certainly you, you probably will be interviewing for credit analyst uh, so you should understand the difference okay all right so uh, the next point is yeah so we have to understand the second point about uh, the OTC versus ETM this should actually be frozen why have I kept uh, yeah I can delete this row Data okay so the second important point that we're going to understand is standardized contracts I think we started on this a little bit standardized contract <coughs> terms versus customized so first we understand, we, we understand what, the what we are saying is uh, that uh, standardized uh, you have uh, in ETM you will have standardized contract terms and in OTC you will have customized contract terms okay you have the freedom to set your contract terms More and you can see it's getting a little irritating this guy's voice we will have to switch it off somewhere I'll have to figure it out well, I don't want to waste time on that right now okay now understand why you have understand why you have everything is connected how everything is connected why do you have customized contract terms in OTC markets because remember in OTC markets you don't have this blue part okay you just have these two guys okay uh, you know dealing with each other so remember uh, I think when I was teaching you contract law, I taught, taught you something called freedom of contract. You remember that expression? Freedom of contract. Very important term, freedom of contract. I've forgotten where this uh, setting. I'll have to go to set. Let it, let it, let him keep talking. Why is that? Means the uh, okay. So let me just write this expression: freedom of contract. Very important term. Okay, especially for people in India, you should understand because this is one of the main reasons that our uh, country is not uh, achieving its economic potential. Freedom of contract. Freedom of contract is a very important uh, principle in um, in market-based economies. Okay, so this is one of the ways you distinguish between the extent to which the government is interfering with freedom of contract. Okay, so freedom of contract essentially means that two parties are when they are contracting adults. Okay, because minors are not allowed to contract. I mean, we don't uh, enforce contracts against minors except in some special cases like provision of necessities and stuff. Uh, but adults, essentially consenting adults when we have contracts okay two people enter into a contract whatever they uh, want to enter into the government should not be interfering the principle of freedom of contract is this okay that if if we, i have entered into a contract with burma that we are betting on the uh, price movement of the nikkei index and we enter into a contract where if the nikkei goes up i will pay him the difference from whatever profit is made from the starting point and if the nikkei goes down then he will pay me okay so this is a contract between uh, two adults okay now this the government should not be interfering in this and saying that no no you can't enter into this kind of contract this is speculative 
okay but which is what the Indian government does basically it goes into every corner of the financial markets and tries to clamp down on speculation so one of the things you'll notice about countries that are developed okay uh, economically developed countries uh, which is mainly the Western countries most of them okay uh, you'll find that there is a cult there is an element of Western culture okay which is especially the anglo-saxon culture okay that basically encourages uh, you know I mean discourages the government from interfering in freedom of contract okay so that's one of the reasons why these economies have prospered because that's what may prospers uh, that's what fosters innovation okay freedom of contract also fosters innovation okay so basically this allows more and also uh, encourages economic activity okay because if we do this some you know there will be some allied uh, you know uh, ancillary industries will crop up okay so there's all kinds of benefits the government and there's no real benefit from government interfering in uh, interfering in freedom of contract so this is one of the things that separates uh, no, the socialistic kind of countries uh, okay like India from the other well-developed countries like the US where the, there's a general uh, sentiment that the government should not interfere in freedom of contract okay which tends to foster innovation as well so freedom of contract understand why uh, so this is a very important expression actually that you should understand what is freedom of contract so if you remember from contract law the contract is made there has to be consensus added in the parties have to understand the same thing in the same way meeting of minds okay so there's a meeting of minds so that is also connected to freedom of contract we negotiate between ourselves like what is happening now in the US China trade negotiations they are going back and forth the Chinese are saying okay, you will lower the tariffs that US are saying no we are not going to lower the tariffs so you have all this back and forth negotiation finally when they agree on the terms they will sign a contract okay they will sign an agreement okay so that's the idea behind freedom of that is also connected to free because no one else is it's not like the Japanese are coming in and telling the US no no you can't agree to this term because the Japanese are not concerned here okay this is between the US and the Chinese so only those two parties are involved in the contract okay in the negotiations so those two parties they they come to that uh, uh, they negotiate between themselves when they agree on the terms they sign the contract so they are free to sign whatever yeah, kind of deal they want else. okay so that's why you have customization of contracts because in the OTC markets there's no other party involved okay so the two parties who are playing in that the, the two parties who are entering into the contract they are free to negotiate between themselves okay so if I go and if I want to add uh, you know uh, enter into somebody as uh, to uh, into a contract saying that you know I'm going to go and give that person piano lessons uh, three times a week and that person has to pay me X amount of money every every month okay so the government is not coming in and telling me no no if somebody is giving piano lessons he has to at least give five lessons a week and this kind of, all these kind of interventions in the terms of the contract the terms are set by the two parties okay so that's why you have customization in OTC markets because there are only two parties involved and they are free no, to set the terms between the themselves this is clear okay you understand the scheme now so all of this is connected so whenever there's a connection to contract law or any other aspect of law you should be able to appreciate that so that you can see the uh, always appreciate the multidisciplinary element of all kinds of uh, real life situations okay so one thing you get what does it mean to have customization let's look at uh, okay now here you see now net Tanya here you can you can see the you can see here the the uh, spot prices let's look at spot let's look at forwards okay now you don't yet know what a forward contract is but you can see can you guys see here that there are different maturities can you see that there are different maturities these are forward prices actually these are swap differences okay of forward points which hopefully we'll have time to discuss later but you can see all the different markets here in the rows for each market you can see now what is the difference between this and this now you'll see this even in the case of futures so one of the differences you'll see between spot and spot on the one hand and futures and forwards on the other hand one of the first superficial kind of differences these are spot prices these are spot FX prices actually Bitcoin okay so these are but by and large these are spot FX prices okay you can see here there's only one price okay bid and ask you can see that you don't have to read the the prices but can you see that I'm not very can you see that guys Puneet can you see which road do you want? Oh, sorry, not Puri, uh, Pulkit. Yes, yes, sir. Can you see the prices? You can see the names of the markets here. Yes, yes. Okay, and you see the bid and offer prices. But there's only one price basically. 
You notice that what I'm trying to highlight here is there's only one price. If you take the average of the bid and ask and take the mid price, okay, that's called the mid price. The average of the bid and ask in the markets is called the mid price, okay? Mm -hmm. So if you look at the mid price, there's only one price for each market, right? Now notice the difference because these are spot prices. In the spot markets, there's only one market, one price because there's only one delivery that we are talking about. Usually two business days from the transaction date. The settlement date will be two business days from the transaction date, okay? Now, here what do you notice? Take any given market, let's say take cable. Is there only one price? There are multiple prices, okay? So this is the thing about forwards and futures, okay? Because forwards and futures, they could be for any given maturity, okay? So usually here you have some standardized because this is a quotation board, they can't keep quoting for all kinds of different ways. They have taken certain standard maturities. So they've taken one week, again, we take the mid prices, one week, one month, three months, six months, one year, okay? So they've quoted these prices. Everyone can see this, are you noticing? So one of the differences you can see between spot on the one hand and uh, forwards and futures is that straight away you can see for forward prices whenever you're looking at forward prices uh, so if you say show me the cable forwards okay then you will expect to be shown different prices for different maturities okay if you ask a broker or somebody show me the cable forwards or show me the dollar yen forwards he, you would expect that he would show you more than one price each price for a different maturity okay so you can see this okay so this is the first thing notice this also about futures here I called out the oil futures prices you can't read it but uh, you can see that there are different prices yeah can you see that this mustard is too big Why is this mustard not going away? Okay, all right. Okay. Can you see now that there are different prices? These are oil futures, okay? Just the last traded price. Can you see that there are different prices for different maturities? Although there are oil futures, it's not just one price. Is it one price? Right? Is it one price? What is happening now? I'll have to deduct marks for uh, Tanya and Parul. So they should, she should ask me. Huh? Okay, fine. I'll just. Uh, but don't talk to don't talk to each other. Okay. Mm -hmm. huh? Mark should be deducted. Yes. Sir. Okay. <laughs> because you're talking. No, no. But then what happens is that. Okay, fine, fine. One second. But don't in future don't talk. If you don't understand something, don't ask your neighbor. You put up your hand and ask me the question. Okay. Okay. Be quiet now, guys. So the other thing that I was trying to show you is in the case of futures also. If you ask a broker, show me the futures run for crude oil, West Texas crude oil, you would expect that he will show you multiple prices. Each price, can you notice that the prices are different? For different, just focus on this column, last. Can you see that? The, I don't know if you can read the prices at the back. Meha, can you read the prices? You can't read the prices? Column, last, 5688, 5674. You can't read it? not big enough the font is not big enough okay all right okay so but anyway let's show you something let's try and make it a little bigger again then masthead will come back now can you read you can see the prices so you see the prices are different and they are for different maturities jan 2020 feb 20 this is a jan contract feb contract March contract, April, May, June, July, August. You can see all, all the prices are different. Yes. So one of the first uh, superficial differences you notice between spot on the one hand, okay, a spot, uh, a price value cash or a price value spot, and on the other hand, uh, futures and forwards. Is that futures and forwards? And you saw this in options also. Option prices are also for different maturities. 
okay so here also you see the case of futures and forwards so first superficial thing you notice is that there's not just one price usually there's multiple prices okay if you ask for a specific maturity if you ask me if you ask for show me the may 2020 futures then he'll show you only 55 55 right but otherwise if you show me a, if you say show me a futures one <coughs> then he will show you the entire table okay and in all prices are traded for many many uh, maturities you can see almost going out five years six years you'll see prices going out for that far ahead okay so you can see here like this one right now if you look at one year forward this there is no trading right now maybe this maturity but you can see december 2020 is traded if you want to buy oil for december 2020 the price is 53.24 okay and it's different from the if you want to buy oil for jan 2020 it's 56.87 okay so there is some there's some one of there's quite a bit of difference okay so uh, so is this clear to everyone the first thing we notice okay so what are we saying what what was the top point that we were deciding customization is what we were discussing yes. okay yeah okay now I know why I came to this okay uh, let's look at the forward prices once again so the customization remember because in OTC in OTC what did, you've got only two parties so they are free to negotiate the terms of the contract okay uh, freedom of contract then what will happen let's say you have a uh, let's say we have a US company like ICI PLC okay which wants to say sell cable let's say six months forward okay six months forward means you already familiar with six uh, settlement dates and transaction dates which means transaction date will be today okay they are looking to sell cable okay so what are they looking to buy if they are looking to sell cable what are they looking to buy US dollars why GBP if they are selling cable when we say selling cable we say selling dollar yen we are always talking about the base asset in a market so in the cable market the base asset is sterling so if they are selling cable they are looking to buy dollars okay so for whatever reason maybe they have some payments to make in the US okay uh, they have to buy they have to buy dollars six months forward but in the market generally when you trade you trade in terms of the base asset okay you, pref you would prefer to trade in terms of the base asset so one of the ways in which you have customization in OTC markets is say ICI PLC wants to sell but they don't actually want to sell for six months forward what they need is maybe six months and say uh, 14 days the because they have to make a payment on a certain date to a US supplier let's say okay so they're going to be selling cable and uh, buying US dollars okay selling sterling buying cable if you sell cable you sell sterling and you buy US dollars so they have to make a payment which is going to be basically from today they think that the rate today is very good they like the rate today so they want to lock in the price today okay so the transaction date will be today but the payment doesn't have to be made until six months and 14 days in the future okay six months and 14 days from spot so for it's actually 16 months 16 days six months and 16 days from today okay so uh, because from today to two months will be the spot maturity okay so, sorry today to two days business days two business days will be spot maturity so when you look at forward maturities you count them from out of spot in over uh, you know addition to spot so suppose uh, now ICI PLC has to make this payment okay of a US dollar amount to a US supplier and the payment has to be made about six months six and a half months from now okay so what they can do this is the beauty of OTC markets okay so they let's say they go to Barclays London they can go to Barclays London and say that uh, I want to show me a cable uh, price for a forward cable price for whatever that date is they will quote okay six months from uh, six months and 14 days from now whatever that date is they will quote that date let's say it's may 20 may uh, 25th or something like that okay 25th of may 2020 so show me a cable price for uh, value 25th may 2020 okay is this clear they will say so that's what we call in the markets we call an odd date because it's neither six months nor seven months it's a broken date or an odd date we call this a broken date or an odd date okay so but this is the beauty of odc markets because two parties are making the terms of making up the terms of the contract they are free to negotiate okay whatever terms they want so in the odc markets you can actually go and request this kind of thing especially if you're a corporate customer okay but even interbank you can uh, between two banks also you can ask for this kind of price okay so barclays london in this case is the market maker so barclays let's just take the six month price although we are taking a price for six months and 14 days so barclays london will quote the 66 86 69 1 okay 
they would quote this uh, forward points price to ICIPLC, which is a cost corporate customer. Okay, so one of the first things you notice, one first thing that is non-standard is the customer has chosen uh, a non-standard maturity date. They have not taken a round maturity date of six months. They have taken an odd maturity date or broken date of six months and 14 days. But that's allowed in the OTC markets. That's how you, that's one of the reasons why people use OTC markets, right? So the first flexibility is ha you have is you can request any maturity that you want. Okay. So another thing, understand forwards are an OTC product. Futures are, a, although there is a commonality in the case of both forwards and futures, you see multiple prices, multiple prices for different maturities. But there is one difference, one important difference. Futures are an exchange traded product. Okay, this is there in your uh, in your notes itself. If you see under ETM, you see futures as an example, and in your OTC, you see forwards as an example. So if somebody asks you to differentiate between forward contracts and OTC and futures contracts, one simple way in terms of the logic in your mind is you straight away you understand that uh, futures are ETC, ETM and uh, forwards are OTC. Okay. So obviously when you talk to somebody, you don't say ETM and OTC, you say exchange traded markets and OTC markets, but I don't want to keep saying these big words every time. So I'm just using these shortcuts. Okay. So uh, ETM, uh, futures are ETM, so straight away you know. And and all the differences that apply to ETM versus OTC, all of those will apply to futures contracts versus forward contracts. This is clear. Are you clear? Okay. So if we say that say Verma is a BBA student, and so therefore he has to have all the characteristics of BBA students, and if we say Ritesh is a MCA student, then he has to have all the characteristics of MCA students. Okay. So one of the ways, one of, if you want to say distinguish between the two of them. One of the way you can distinguish is straight away. Just take look up all the properties of MCA students, and he will have those properties. And all the characteristics of B BBA students, he will have to have those properties. This is clear. This is the uh, logic that you should follow. Futures are ETM, forwards are OTC products. Okay. So because forwards are OTC products, and we know that in the OTC markets, one of the advantages that you have is customized contract terms. Okay. So now you can see in a real life example what is meant by customization so you have a corporate customer ICI PLC a very big chemical company wants to make a payment to a US vendor and that payment is going to happen around six and a half months from now so they request a maturity date they call up Barclays London for a price <laughs> but they request a maturity date which is an odd date it is not a rounded six months because the interbank market is trading in one week, one month, three months, six months, rounded month, monthly amount. Because the interbank players trade with each other, the market makers are trading with each other, okay, in large amounts, in rounded amounts, okay, usually million dollar multiples, okay, and trading for standard maturities, okay. But here comes a corporate customer, and this is the beauty of the OTC markets. They can actually come and ask, request a market maker like Barclays London, show me a price for six and a half months. Uh, for for cable they will not usually show their side okay they will not showing their side means they're telling you whether I want to sell or buy okay so they'll just say that show me a price for cable for six and a half months for this value date okay six and a half months whatever the value date is show me a cable <coughs> forward price for this value date this is clear. first element of customization maturity date has been uh, made non-standard okay second is in the interbank markets, you usually trade in round amounts, like just like you see U.S. equity options. And this is an exchange traded market product. U.S. equity options which you were trading, those are standardized. Okay, those are actually 100 100 shares per contract. Okay, similarly in the interbank market, although it's OTC, the convention between big market makers when they're trading with themselves is rounded amounts in million dollars. Okay, so people actually in the interbank markets when they say I'm selling seven dollars. Doesn't mean they're actually selling seven dollars like one, two, three, four, five, seven, but they're actually selling seven million dollars. Okay, so the million is not mentioned because that is understood to be the trading unit. Okay, so here again, ICI PLC can say that let's say whatever the rate is, the you know the fi final rate, which will be a function of the spot, and yeah. So, so you mean to say that in OTC market, they actually can buy a uh, seven point one four contract also? Yeah, that's what I'm coming to. Okay, so that is the beauty of the OTC markets. Now, let's say that the dollar amount, because actually they want to buy, in, uh, they want to buy a certain dollar amount. Okay, then let's say that the, the sterling equivalent of that dollar amount. Okay, so they're asking for a price in the base asset itself. Okay, so the sterling equivalent of that. Dollar amount let's say would be seven million sterling 
okay let's say they actually need to sell uh, so, sorry not 7 million let's take a odd amount say it is let's say 6 million 375000 sterling okay let's say the dollar amount that they need to pay to the us supplier if you look at the approximate market rates today the amount of sterling that they need to sell to buy that amount of dollars is 6,375,000 okay and 14 sterling you can make it as odd as you want okay so here's the point as the Tarun brought out second element of customization you can see that the customer can also request a price for an odd amount okay odd lot basically so here you don't even say odd lot because here understood that in in otc markets there is no concept of odd lot and there is of course inter interbank concept you can say you can use it we don't normally use that term we just say a non-standard amount okay uh, because the odd lot is used in an exchange traded context exchange traded market context. yeah yeah no you don't say contracts in the number of contracts you don't use in the otc context otc context you just talk about amount you just say what, what is the amount okay you don't talk about contract size because there is no contract size as such the convention that is there between market players and say foreign exchange to trade in million dollar multiples that's just a convention we don't call it a contract size so like you said in US equity market you can only deal in multiples of 100 yes so you can 100 contracts or more so in OTC market, we can also buy 1 to 5 contracts. Yeah, yeah. Not, not con we don't use the word contracts. In, in an OTC market, uh, because the contract size concept does not exist in OTC markets. So the example that I gave you where foreign exchange market makers trade, usually trade between themselves in million dollar multiples, okay, integer multiples of million dollars. But that's just a convention. It's not sufficiently formal to be called a contract size. Are you following what no, I'm saying? It's, it's that is just a convention. Even in, in between interbank market makers, sometimes a market maker, say City Hong Kong, can no, call Barclays London and ask for a price in you know 3.758 billion yen. They can do that. Okay, so it's not so, it, and it's not considered anything unusual. Okay, so it's so so this. What is the term that we use for OTC? OTC, you just say amount or size amount is better okay so amount of the base asset or amount of the terms asset second element of cost so are you following the elements of customization let's write it down in this so that you have we can um, two minutes left one minute one minute be quiet be quiet be quiet second element of customization is you can play with the amount there's no fixed amount okay so first element of customization i'll write it down later so what we are saying first amount of element of customization you can play with the maturity date maturity date of the contract you can play with unlike unlike uh, futures contracts where you have fixed maturities jan 2020 you can't go anywhere in between you have to choose whatever contract you choose you're stuck the maturity is tightly defined you have to stick to maturity everything is standardized okay in in otc you can play with the maturity date you can play with the amount okay so you can take a very odd amount all kinds of broken figures you can take and you can deal that amount and it's considered normal in otc markets third element of customization also is that you can deal in the terms currency normally when we deal in markets we talk about dealing in the when i want to sell 100 cable if I want to sell 100 cable, if I call a market maker and say I want to sell 100 cable, he will understand that I'm looking to sell 100 million sterling because it is understood that all amount references are to base asset. But here ICI PLC can even call Barclays London and say show me a cable forward price for six and a half months forward, okay, in amount of uh, six million dollars. Six million dollars may not convert to a rounded sterling amount. So you have already tampered with the standard sterling amount and you are also now asking for the amount in terms currency. You are not giving the amount which is the convention is to give the amount in the base currency. You have now also played with that and you can give the amount in terms currency also. So three elements of customization are possible. Okay, uh, which brings out the distinction comes out clearly in the foreign exchange markets where both are currencies. Okay, so you can play you can ask for a price in the terms currency which is normally considered unconventional you can uh, ask for odd maturity dates and you can ask for odd amounts not rounded amounts 
Clear? Three elements of customization. Okay. You can also build in all kinds of other contractual uh, flexibility and uh, negotiation up and down here, this and that. Those, those are specialized contracts. But for basic contracts, now Garvit is happy. Yes. We can. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we'll continue in the next class. So please remember that your project is closing. Yes, sir. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Friday is the last day of trading. Tomorrow. Yes. Trading whenever New York New York closes. Whenever New York closes, that's your end, end day. And and you have to submit the report by Monday.